Hello and welcome to our multi-part study of India's most beloved spiritual classic, and that's saying something, the Bhagavad Gita. And we're going to be studying the Iknath Iswaran English translation from Nilgiri Press, 2007, by the book. It's, it's going to be an, an integral part of your home library, your journey toward life's wisdom, and your engagement in this course. So I'm going to be looking at key passages with you and I'll do my best to be the tour guide and, and help make the story connect with your and my everyday life. The Bhagavad Gita means literally Lord's Song, like the Lord's Prayer in the Christian tradition, the Lord's Song. And it is without a doubt, the most down-to-earth, relatable, and insightful in, in everyday terms of all the great classics of Indian wisdom. And I'm going all the way back to the Vedas and the Upanishads and, and all of the rest. Uh, the great epics, the Mahabharata, of which this is a tiny part, um, and the other epic stories. There's Ra Lord Rama right there. From, from these some of these amazing stories. But the Gita, let's call it the Gita for short, has a real special place in all of that. And I'm, I'm wondering with you today, why is it the most popular, the most beloved for ordinary people, not just for scholars, but for ordinary people of all the Indian scriptures? And I think We'll discover and answer that question together, but just to foreshadow it a little bit, let's look back again. The Vedas from many, many thousands of years ago, thousands of years BCE, were written by rishis, by seers and scholars of the Brahmin caste for other Brahmins. And they are, that's where all Hinduism and Indian knowledge begins, is the Vedas. But they are esoteric, they're, they're inside texts for specialists of the tradition. And the elite quality of the Vedas then is it doesn't filter down to ordinary folks as easily. And then in the late Vedic period came the Upanishads from, you know, I'm just ballparking in here from, you know, 1000 or 1200 BCE to Seven or 500 BCE, that, that late Vedic period saw a, a flowering of a new approach. Upanishad means to sit near a teacher. And so the Upanishads were records of dialogues often between teachers and students, people who had been immersed in a lifelong study of Vedic wisdom. But the door began to crack open to allow and to spotlight ordinary seekers from any caste called sannyasin or or renunciants so that made if this is the right word that made the process more democratic more egalitarian more open to all and by the way this this axial age of 500 bce went all over the world enormous philosophical um importance is taking shape in the in the Mediterranean you have you know the Pythagoreans and Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and in the deserts of Judea you have the 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 uh, early Jewish scripture the Old Testament as Christians call it taking shape over in China you have Lao Tzu and Confucius of course of the Taoist and Confucian tradition so it's remarkable that all over the world in that in that rough time frame of around 500 BC there was this explosion of philosophical literature, including the Upanishads. And what else is happening in India at that time? The Buddha, who comes out of the Indian traditions and begins to teach his pragmatic approach to awakening. And the Bhagavad Gita comes after all of that. The Gita, we, we can, I think, safely place it around the time of Christ. 200 BCE to about 200 CE. So in that 400 year period there, and, and in a way it is responding to all of that. And, and perhaps that's the evolution, you know, the Vedas, more elite, the Upanishads for 
you know, seekers of any kind, but still specialists, people who threw it all off to go live in the forest and devote themselves completely to the pursuit of moksha, of Satchitananda, of the realization of Brahmanatman. But the Bhagavad Gita is for all of us. And, and as we'll see in the coming videos, it tells the story of an ordinary man, you know, uh, a member of the Kshatra caste, a warrior prince called Arjuna. And Arjuna is poised on the cusp of battle. And the struggle that he will have and the dialogue that he will have with his, really his subordinate, his chariot driver, you know, Krishna is the archer and, and, the, and the leader of his army. And his subordinate, the, the transportation guy, Krishna, um, it is eventually revealed, spoiler alert, is Lord Krishna an avatar or incarnation of none other than Lord Vishnu himself. And as we'll get into the later chapters, we'll see that, that reveal uh, fully blossom. But here at the beginning of the story, we just see an ordinary guy, not a yogi, not a rishi, not a scholar. Uh, he doesn't have time to go meditate in the woods all day. This is a working man. And Arjuna, therefore, I think, stands in for all of us. Each of us is the Arjuna of our own lives. Those of us who are householders, who have mortgages, marriages, children, careers, lives in the marketplace. Does Hinduism have something for us? And the answer to that question is the Bhagavad Gita. So I think that's why this book is really the most beloved of all and the most enduring because it opens the door to the realization of oneness with Brahmanatman right here in the midst of my ordinary life, in the work that I am already doing. A lot to unpack here. Let's get started in our multi-video study of the Bhagavad Gita. So it begins in chapter one, there's 18 chapters, it begins with a setup chapter. And I'm not gonna bog you down in all the names of this rather complex setup. Let's distill it down to this. There are two armies facing each other across an empty battlefield. On one side is Krishna's army, excuse me, Arjuna's army. I'll probably do that a lot. On one side is Arjuna's army with Krishna. And on the other side is the other guys. And let's just boil it down to this. The other guys have been in charge for a long time and they're the bad guys. And they must be defeated. And we are seeing this through the lens of, the, of, of Krishna and his brothers and cousins and family and friends and childhood friends and all of that. And they have this job to do. They have to face that other army in battle. And so the book begins on the cusp of this battle, which is about to take place. And Arjuna says to his chariot driver, who named Krishna, hey Krishna, will you pull this chariot out in the middle of the battlefield? I wanna kind of take a look around here before we get started. And so Krishna pulls, you know, drives the chariot, a, a single axle, two wheeled cart out into the middle of this field with a bunch of horses pulling it. And Arjuna begins to speak, and he says to Krishna, who's, who's, a, who's an old friend of his and, and, and a trusted advisor, he says to Krishna, you know, I look back at our army and I see, you know, my uncles and my brothers and my cousins and my friends from school, these are all guys that I love, and I look across at the other army, or just as close now because he's in the middle, and I see other cousins and other friends that I knew from school and guys from the neighborhood. And, and, and isn't it a sin to kill? Wouldn't it be evil? If we have this battle, we're all gonna run out here in the middle of this battlefield. In a half hour, half of us are gonna be dead. And for what? Isn't that murder? Isn't that evil? Isn't that a sin? And he says at one point to his teacher, Krishna, he says, uh, oh, Krishna, I see my own relations here anxious to fight. 
afraid. And my limbs grow weak, my mouth is dry, my body shakes, and my hair is standing on end. My skin burns, and the bow, Gandiva, named his bow, Gandiva, has slipped from my hand. I am unable to stand. My mind seems to be whirling. He's having an anxiety attack. His mouth is going dry, he drops his tools, he's crumbling. And he sinks to his knees and he, he pleads with Krishna, please tell me that we should not do this, that this is a moral evil. And what do you think Krishna is going to say? I mean, we've already let the cat out of the bag. He is an avatar, you know, an incarnation of Lord Vishnu, essentially a direct counterpart to Jesus in the Christian tradition, who for Christians is an incarnation of the Lord, come to earth in human form to instruct and so on. So uh, Krishna plays that same role, only the difference is in Hinduism, there are scores of these avatars or incarnations, not just one. That's a story for another day. But we're, our focus is Krishna today. So you, you think Krishna might, might honor Arjuna's um, pacifist impulse, you know, that violence is bad, right? But that's not what Krishna says. Krishna says at the beginning of chapter two, he says, you know, your, your words have merit. He says, you speak sincerely. Krishna now talking, you speak sincerely, but your sorrow has no cause. The wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. It's going to shift under our feet now. It's going to get weird. Because this wisdom teacher, Krishna, is going to teach Arjuna for the next 17 chapters, chapters 2 through 18, why he should fight. Why he must fight. Why it is his duty or his dharma to take action in the field of action. Now, before we get into the all-important chapter two, we have to pose this question. It's a question Mahatma Gandhi posed. And our, our translator, Iknath Iswaran, was an associate of Gandhi, and they got a chance to meet many times and work together. And so this is a living question for Iswaran, who passed away a few years ago. For Gandhi, who, for whom this was his most beloved book, I told that story in another video, but when uh, Gandhi was just, you know, a young man studying law far from home in London, he fell in with a group of theosophists, Americans and Brits, and they were studying the Bhagavad Gita. Gandhi had never paid much attention to it when he was in India, but now he's, you know, the early 20th century, he's in London and he's reading this in Sanskrit and in English, and it really takes root. It ends up becoming one of the most formative texts in Gandhi's life, and we'll we'll touch back on that many times through our through our Gita series because it's such a beautifully illustrative point that Gandhi, who whom we all know is sort of the paradigm of nonviolence, right, of ahimsa. Why would he love a book where the guy says you should fight, where Krishna's advice is go to war? Well. Here's where we have to ask the question, is this book to be read literally or metaphorically? And that's a question we pose when we read any ancient epics. You know, like I said, this is a small part of the large multi-volume -vol series of Indian mythology called the Mahabharata, the longest epic poem on earth, much longer than the Iliad and the Odyssey. And in the Mahabharata, there's lots of wars, lots of gods, there's lots of family drama, real soap opera, yeah? And in this one scene kind of extracted from the Mahabharata where Krishna and Arjuna have this dialogue on the cusp of this battle, there is still that beautiful lyrical quality and that mythical quality. Now, was Arjuna a real guy? Was, was this story based on a real battle? Many historians say yes, around 1000 BC. And you can even travel in India to the alleged um, battlefield where this took place. But it's one of those stories that kind of, like King Arthur in the round table, that is kind of true, but kind of 
disappears into the mists of prehistory. And in our study of world mythology, we find, along with Joseph Campbell, that mythology is often more fruitfully read, not as literal history, but as metaphor. What does this really mean? That's the, that's the tack Gandhi will take. Gandhi will read this story as metaphor that, again, each of us is the Arjuna of our own lives. And, and what this is really saying is, in metaphorical, symbolic terms, is that you and I find ourselves in a battlefield. So the battlefield becomes a metaphor for the field of action, the field of karma, where you have find yourself in society with all of these other sentient conscious beings, all of these other forms that were that are manifested forms from the formless of uh, Brahmanatman. And here we all are now in biological bodies in competition, eating each other, struggling for power and property and love and, and honor. And it's a bloody mess out here. And we, like Arjuna, find ourselves struggling with others, you know, struggling for partners, struggling for income, for to put food on the table, struggling against the elements, struggling against predators, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a little bit of a fight quality to life. And so for Gandhi, this battlefield that we're describing here at the beginning of the Gita, the battle that Arjuna does not want to participate in, I mean, who can, who can not relate to that? Have you ever faced a struggle or a crisis in your life or a battle that you had to wage in your life? And you just didn't want to. You just wanted to go home and go to bed. And you begin to rationalize in your mind like, oh, this is, this is, uh, this is, this is wrong. If I take action here, people are going to get hurt. And so Arjuna represents us. And, and look at how Krishna counsels Arjuna. Again, he says to Arjuna, you speak sincere, sincerely, but your sorrow has no cause. The wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. There has never been a time when you and I and the kings gathered here have not existed. Nor will there be a time when we will cease to exist. As the same person inhabits the body through childhood, youth, and old age, so too at the time of death he attains another body. The wise are not deluded by these changes. Right away, right out of the gate and early on the second page of chapter 2, Krishna begins to teach Arjuna something he probably already knows. He begins to teach him about the Atman. That our bodies are, are born and they're going to die. They come into being and they go out of being. But as Krishna just said, at the level of the self, of the Atman, there never was a time when you did not exist nor will there ever be a time when you cease to exist. That is some fresh context in which to view the question of life and death. As Eckhart Tolle put it in his beautiful book, Stillness Speaks, life is not the opposite of death. The opposite of death is birth. Life has no opposite. That's what Krishna just told Arjuna. He goes on in verse 16 of chapter 2. The impermanent has no reality. Reality lies in the eternal. Those who have seen the boundary between these two have attained the end of all knowledge. Realize that which pervades the universe and is indestructible. Realize it. Make it real. No power can affect this unchanging, imperishable Reality. The body is mortal, but that which dwells in the body is immortal and immeasurable. Therefore, Arjuna, fight in this battle. And here's some language that I promised you back in our videos on the Katha Upanishad are going to sound familiar to you because they were practically verbatim in the Katha Upanishad. Krishna goes on. One believes he is the slayer. Another believes he is the slain. Both are ignorant. There is neither slayer 
nor slain. You were never born. You will never die. You have never changed. And the you in this sentence is the Atman, not the ego, body. Unborn, eternal, immutable, immemorial. You do not die when the body dies. Realizing, making real, that which is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and unchanging. How can you slay or cause another to slay? As one abandons worn out clothes and acquires new ones, so when the body is worn out, a new one is acquired by the self, by the Atman who lives within. So he goes on and on on this song of the Atman, of the essential self unborn and undying that is within us. And then he shifts gears and starts talking about Arjuna's Dharma, his purpose. He says, considering your dharma, you should not vacillate. For a warrior, nothing is higher than a war against evil. The warrior confronted with such a war should be pleased. And if you do not participate in this battle against evil, you will incur sin, violating your dharma and your honor. So this is a little bit of a guilt trip. <laughs> that Krishna lays on Arjuna and says, look, look, man, you're a kshatra. You are born into the, not the Brahmin caste, but the second caste down, which is the political and military class. You're not a merchant. You're not a laborer. This is, this is what you were born to do. This is your job. And in a sense, if you don't do this, a lot of people are going to die. See, that's the, that's the thing Gandhi focuses on, that when you and I find ourselves in the field of action, if I take this action, a lot of people are going to get hurt. If I don't take this action, a lot of other people are going to get hurt. Either way, people are going to hurt. And so it is childish in that sense then to run away from one's duty that all forms come and go, as the Buddha will say, and that you and I are not the managers of the universe. We are all given roles to play and to employ our free will in concert with God's will, with the will of the self, to carry out the, the divine mission of our lives. I know this is skirting for many of us dangerously close to the concept of holy war, which has plagued humanity, right, for millennia. Every army believes it has God on its side, and Gandhi's very aware of this. We want to be careful here. This is not the blind authorization of all violence. This is a carefully considered philosophical reconsideration of the fact that every day I have to eat food. Every day I'm gonna put thousands of calories of formerly living things into this hole in front of my face. I'm gonna chew it up and swallow it. It's not my fault. Um, I didn't invent the rules of this game. You know, I, I was born into this biological body which burns heat, needs fuel. Um, all around me, animals are eating animals. And animals are eating plants. Now, as a human being, I can choose to just eat plants and, and so on. We are all aware of that. But we have to eat living things. We have to eat the embodied energy of the sun, whether it's embodied in a plant or whether it's embodied in an animal that ate some plants. So that is violence. And so it's wise to consider that ahimsa, or causing no, uh, causing no harm, is not a blanket pacifism. It is the mature recognition that in order for there to be a world at all, there is life taking life, and that we must engage in this. It, it's a paradox, and the whole rest of the Gita is packed with wisdom about how to navigate that paradox with honor, with courage, with humility, with selflessness, with dignity, and even with love. To not kill out of ego and pride, and certainly not in rage, but always in the consciousness that I am not the doer. I am the instrument that is being used by powers beyond me. 
And, and, and so that's called karma yoga, right? To act without attachment to the fruits of my action. Um, beautiful lines in, in chapter two, and then we'll work our way toward the end here. Uh, I love this one. Just as a reservoir of li- is of little use when the whole countryside is flooded, scriptures are of little use to the illumined man or woman who sees the Lord everywhere. I'm a big fan of scripture. I mean, here I am doing a whole video series on this beloved scripture. But, you know, there's a little hint there, isn't there, that just as a reservoir is of little use when the whole countryside is flooded, <laughs> uh, scriptures are of little use when you are flooded with the direct experience of the divine, which is like that flood all around us, within us, without us, in everyone we meet, in every choice we make. He says here, Krishna says here about karma yoga, about action without attachment to the fruits of action, selfless action, but it's simply. He says, you have the right to work, but never to the fruit of work. You should never engage in action for the sake of reward. Perform, nor, nor should you long for inaction, which was the first chapter. He longed for inaction. He's like, don't do that, but also don't do work for selfish rewards. He goes on, perform work in this world, Arjuna, as a man established within himself, without selfish attachments, alike in success and defeat. For yoga is perfect evenness of mind. Seek refuge in the attitude of detachment, and you will amass the wealth of spiritual awareness. Those who are motivated only by desire for the fruits of action are miserable, for they are constantly anxious about the results of what they do. Hmm, That sounds familiar. When consciousness is unified, however, all vain anxiety is left behind. There is no cause for worry whether things go well or ill. The wise unify their consciousness and abandon attachment to the fruits of action. Krishna calls it holy indifference. Again, Buddhism tends to use the phrase non-attachment. Holy indifference. In the, in the, in the theistic light language of the Western tradition, say Christianity, you know, let go and let God. Trust that whatever happens, it is God's will or in the language of the Stoics, Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, it is the will of nature, it is fate, whatever is unfolding. And to remove anxiety from one's life, as Jesus says in, in I think, the Gospel of Matthew, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. To let slip all worry and anxiety, just get up in the morning, put on your pants, have a cup of coffee or tea or whatever you drink and do the work in front of you without anxiety about results. Just show up humbly. Stop trying to control everything. Recognize that your voice is needed in the choir and just sing it loud. No one else can sing your part. You have a part to play, Arjuna. And so chapter two is, is really, well, the way, the way Gandhi put it, chapter two is, is in a sense, the whole Bhagavad Gita. And so, so much so he believed that, that he carried a copy of chapter two with him in his pocket, Gandhi did, his whole life. That's how important the Gita was to him. Think of all the things Gandhi did in the Satyagraha to play such an instrumental role in the overthrowing of British colonial rule in India and to lead so many workers' rights, uh, nonviolent protests, and to work so hard to bring peace between Islam and Hinduism, all the other beautiful things that Gandhi was involved in as a, as a political activist and a deeply spiritual reformer. He found the root and the courage of all of that work in chapter two of the Gita. Not only did he carry chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita in his pocket, he carried Jesus's longest speech 
from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Look it up. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Imagine if you made a document that had the Sermon on the Mount and chapter 2 of the Gita and read that every morning. I wonder if those were your morning pages, how it might begin to inform your life to see yourself as an instrument of the divine and to let your egoic attachments to things shrink smaller and smaller, leaving more and more space for the Lord, for God, for Brahmanatman, for the holy, for, for that which is real, that which manifests itself as us in the field of time to do our work. As Rumi says, that each of us is a flute through which God plays the song of the universe. Get up on the roof, Rumi says. Sing loud. Be your note. So that's chapter one and two of the Gita. Join me in our next video, the Bhagavad Gita part two, where we'll jump into chapter three and they, they're, they're, the chapters are quite short and they usually just have a key point or two in each one. And we'll go ahead and move through the rest of the teachings. We have a lot of ground to discover because we need help now to understand how is it that I can engage, not in literally in battle, I'm not gonna go around and killing anybody, but how can I engage in my own struggles in this life with honor, with dignity, with reverence, with self-love, with self-respect and with love and respect for all who I meet, even those in whom I must struggle against. See you on the other side.